Hey guys, it's Chaos Maelstrom here, and welcome to the bonus episode of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Now, before we complete the game, but there are still a few more things that I haven't addressed in the game. Don't worry, I will be covering pretty much everything that I haven't already talked about. So, without any further ado, here we go. Okay, so, the main thing that people are probably asking about that I haven't talked about is Hero Mode. It's basically the new game plus of the game, except instead of getting easier, it gets harder. Again, you start the game anew, but in hero mode, you will take more damage, and no hearts appear. That's right, absolutely none. Unless you find yourself a heart medal and put it in your adventure pouch, you will have no way of collecting hearts. Also, Materials and bugs that you collected in the previous installment of your save file will be carried over. But aside from that, that's the only benefits that you get from doing hero mode. There are also a few characters, I believe, that uh, pick dialogue choices at you for doing hero mode. I know that the instructor Horwell at the start of the game says something about when you start hero mode, but that's all I know. Now, one of the main things I glossed over in the game that I didn't talk about was Bamboo Island. This is that island that I neglected to go to that looked like I could do something at. It's the one that looks like it has the big bamboo shoots coming out of the top of a circular little fortress or something. If you go inside, we'll find uh, Petrus' dad, and he will basically allow us to play a mini game, and we can get materials from doing this. However, it's advised that you uh, power up your sword first because if, for some reason, you're not going to be able to play the game properly unless you have a long sword. Don't ask me why, that's just how it works. But, yeah, there's basically a big stick of bamboo in the middle, and you cut it and you get rewarded based on how many times you cut the stick of bamboo before it completely falls. Aside from that, there are some other mini-games that we can play as well. Thrill Digger in Elden Volcano, I went over that before, that's basically Minesweeper, where you can get rupees. But there's no real other perks to doing it, and it's kind of difficult. I wouldn't really recommend it. You can replay any of the uh, quote-unquote jobs you underwent while you were in debt at the Lumpy Pumpkin. And you can get paid for those. Uh, you can also redo Fledge's Pumpkin Pole minigame. But Lord knows I don't want to redo that. Also, if you want to go back to the Rickety Coaster, you can go there too and play around. Of course, you guys already know how I feel about that mini game. Also, you can go to Bug Island and try to set some high scores with Stritch's Bug Challenges. And finally, there's Dodo's High Dive. If you want, you can rob poor Dodo of even more money by continually landing through the, on the five, 50 rupee space while going through all the fortune rings and stealing 500 rupees. I did it easily on my second try. I don't see why anybody else would have trouble with it as well. And now for probably what is arguably the hands-down hardest thing in the entire game. The complete boss rush mode. This is what happens if you go to Lanayru and try boss rush mode in hero mode. You will have access to all of the boss fights. Even the ones you haven't accessed while playing through hero mode yet. That's right, even the ones that you get after hero mode, is what I'm saying. The last four boss fights include the third battle with the Imprisoned, the final battle with Girahim, Demise, and, for some really weird reason, the Horde battle, which is the horde of enemies that you fight before you fight Girahim for the first time. Now, this brings me to a little question. Why, we, why is that classified as a boss battle, but not Leviathan? Huh? I mean, Leviathan even had two titles, one for Leviathan himself and one for Bilokai. The Horde battle didn't get a title. It shouldn't be a boss, technically. Okay, but that's just a minor rant for me. But yes, you will have the option of fighting through these 12 bosses. They will all be unlocked at the time of hero mode. And yes, you can't collect any hearts in this mode either. So it is very hard. You have to be insanely good at the game in order to pull this off, and I am not on. However, if you win eight consecutive battles, you win the Highland Shield. But since we have Demise in the final 
the other boss fights in there, like the second rematch with the Imprisoned, I would highly recommend you be a god at playing this game before attempting to even get anywhere near four victories. Because chances are, along the way, you're going to run into the Imprisoned or Demise. That's pretty much about it for this game. There's not really much else I can say now. To bring this project to a final close, I actually want to read a story. This is the story that inspired the design for my favorite dungeon in the Zelda series, The Ancient Sister. It's a story by Akutagawa Ryonosuke, entitled The Spider's Thread. The design of The Ancient Sister was based off of this story, as well as one of my favorite parts of this dungeon. So I would like to read this story to you. So I will end the video like this with me reading the story. It's a little dark, but it will also explain some of the design behind the dungeon. Until next time, this has been Chaos Mail Show, and I will see you guys in the next project. Laters! One day, the Buddha was strolling alone along the edge of a lotus pond in paradise. The blooming lotus flowers in the pond were each pure white, like jewels, and the place was filled with the indescribably wonderful fragrance continually emitting from each flower's golden center. It was just morning in paradise. After a time, the Buddha paused at the edge of the pond, and from between the lotus leaves that covered it saw a glimpse of the state of things below. Now this celestial pond just happened to lie directly over hell, and peering through the crystal clear water was like looking through a magnifying glass at the river of death and the mountain of needles and such. The Buddha saw there, in the depths of hell, a single man writhing along with the other sinners. This man was named Kandata and he had been a notorious thief who had performed murder and arson and other acts of evil. In his past, however, he had performed just one good deed. One day, when walking through the deep forest, he saw a spider crawling along the road. At first he raised his foot to crush it, but suddenly he changed his mind and stopped saying, No, small though it may be, a spider too has life. It would be a pity to meaninglessly end it. And so, he did not kill it. Looking down upon the captives in hell, the Buddha recalled his kind act that Kandata had performed, and thought to use his good deed as a way to save him from his fate. Looking aside, there on the jade-colored lotus leaf he saw a single spider, spinning out a web of silver thread. The Buddha carefully took the spider's thread into his hand, and lowered it straight between the jewel-like white lotuses into the depths of hell. Kandata was floating and sinking along with the other sinners in the lake of blood at the bottom of hell. It was pitch black, no matter which way he looked, and the occasional glimpse of light that he would see in the darkness would turn out to be just a glint of the terrible mountain of needles. How lonely he must have felt. All about him was the silence of the grave, the only occasional sound being a faint sigh from one of the damned. Those who were so evil as to be sent to this place were tired by its various torments, and left without even the strength to cry out. Even the great thief Kandata could only squirm like a dying frog as he choked in the lake of blood. But one day, raising up his head and glancing at the sky above the lake, in the empty darkness, Kandata saw a silver spider's thread being lowered from the ceiling, so far, far away. The thread seemed almost afraid to be seen, emitting a frail, constant light as it came down to just above Kandata's head. Cygnus, Kandata couldn't help but clasp his hands in joy. If he were to cling to this thread and climb up it, he may be able to climb out of hell, perhaps even even climb all the way up to paradise. Then he would never be chased up the mountain of needles, nor drowned in the lake of blood again. Thinking so, he firmly grasped the spider's thread with both hands and began to climb the thread, higher and higher. Having once been a great thief, he was used to tasks such as this. But the distance between hell and paradise is tens of thousands of miles, and so it would seem that no amount of effort would make this an easy journey. After climbing for some time, Kandata tried, and couldn't climb a bit higher. Having no other course, he hung there from the thread, resting, and while doing so looked down below. He saw that he made a good deal of progress. The lake of blood that he had been trapped in was now hidden in the dark below and he had even climbed higher than the dimly glowing mountain of needles. If he could keep up the pace, perhaps he could escape from hell after all. Kandata grasped the thread with both hands, 
and laughingly spoke in a voice that he hadn't used in many years since he had come here. I've done it! I've done it! Looking down, however, what did he see but an endless queue of sinners, intently following him up the thread like a line of ants? Seeing this, surprise and fear kept Kandata hanging there for a time, with mouth open and eyes blinking like a fool. How could this slender spider's web, which should break even under just his weight, support the weight of all these other people? If the thread were to snap, all of his effort would be wasted, and he would fall back into hell with the others. That just would not do. But even as he had these thoughts, hundreds more, thousands more of the damned came crawling up from the lake of blood, forming a line and scaring up the thread. If he didn't do something fast, surely the thread would snap in the middle, and he would fall back down. Condotta shouted out, Hey, you sinners! This thread is mine! Who said you could climb up it? Get off! Get off! Though the thread had been fine until just then, with these words it snapped with a twang right where Kandata held it. Poor Kandata fell headfirst through the air, spinning like a top, right down through the darkness. The severed end of the silver thread hung there, suspended from heaven, shining with its pale light in that moonless, starless sky. The Buddha stood in paradise at the edge of the lotus pond, silently watching these events. After Kandata sank like a stone to the bottom of the lake of blood, he continued his stroll with a sad face. He must have been surprised that even after such severe punishment, Kandata's lack of compassion would lead him right back into hell. Yet the lotus blossoms in the lotus ponds of paradise cared nothing about such matters. Their jewel-like white flowers waved about the feet of the Buddha, and each flower's golden center continuously filled the place with their indescribably wondrous fragrance. It was almost noon in paradise.